Hi, welcome to another episode of MYD Global. I'm your host, Leanne hackman Carty. In this episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Siatone. He's an expert when it comes to disaster medicine. And just to be clear, disaster medicine isn't exactly like emergency medicine. So stay tuned as I talk to Dr. Siatone about the difference and what he's doing in the area to make a huge global impact. <music> Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good. So before we get started on the topic today, just curious if you can tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm I'm an emergency uh, physician by training here in Boston, and um, I'm uh, on staff at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, um, and I'm also a, an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, but, you know, early on in my career, I became interested in and involved in um, disasters and disaster medicine and, and did a lot of work in that arena. So uh, that's really my area of expertise now. Um, some 25 years later, um, I uh, have uh, had the opportunity to be a commander of a federal disaster team um, early on, did a lot of international work in disaster response, preparedness and response, um, and then put you know, some of that experience together into a textbook uh, that's called Seatone's Disaster Medicine. It's now going into its third edition. Um, and uh, so I've had a chance to really kind of uh, explore this area of disaster medicine, try to help, help define it as, as a field. I'm also currently um, the president of the World Association for Disaster and Emergency Medicine. Wow, that's fantastic. So tell me a little bit about that whole field of disaster emergency medicine. What, what components or, or what exactly is involved? Well, if you have a couple of days, I can tell you all about it. But um, it, it, it's, well, first of all, disaster medicine is a little bit different from emergency medicine. Um, you know, emergency medicine, ER doctors, uh, we go to work, you know, every day in our shifts and go to the emergency department and see, and see patients. Um, there is no disaster clinic, so disaster medicine specialists don't wake up in the morning and go to disaster clinic and see disaster patients, right? We're always um, working around these, uh, this, this area where um, there are these uh, low frequency, high acuity events. Um, but because of that, um, you know, there really needs to be an awful lot of, of thought put into mitigation, preparedness, and response. So disaster medicine um, is the healthcare aspect of disasters, um, you know, dealing with disasters essentially. And we work on the, what's called the disaster cycle. So um, again, it's a, sort of a, a circular um, a way that we proceed in mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And in disaster medicine, you know, we do specific things in each one of those areas. And uh, disaster medicine, as we as we define it, and, and as I've, I've done in my textbook, you know, really encompasses a lot of a lot of things. So it can be everything from what I like to call the lights and sirens disasters, um, like mass casualty incidents, um, you know, bad accidents, explosions, bombings, terrorist attacks, um, to other uh, longer term uh, uh, events like we're living through now, right, with the COVID nineteen pandemic, which is also a disaster. But as you can see, just by comparing those two basic uh, areas, um, you can understand that uh, disaster medicine involves different things depending on what it is that you're preparing for and responding to. So natural disasters, um, particularly in, in developing countries, uh, require a certain um, you know um, uh, uh, skill sets essentially to uh, be able to practice in those sort of austere environments and and to uh, be able to respond to, to such events. Um, the, the the mass casualty incidents or lights and sirens disasters, I like to say, really um, depend on a robust emergency system. So that really does get more rooted into emergency medicine. Whereas the pandemics and some of these other longer term disasters, humanitarian crises, pandemics, um, that really is more based on a public health response. It's not so much that lights and sirens response, I like to say. Um, so that really depends on a robust public health system. Um, <clears throat> all that, you know, sort of falls under the umbrella of disaster medicine. But as you can see, um, they're, they're relatively, you know, uh, different things um, and how you must, again, mitigate, prepare and respond for them. So I'm just curious as far as to get training in this field, is there a special, like the, the work you do in Boston, is that doctors and nurses and, and various healthcare professionals that are taking this specialized training or how do they get this expertise? Yeah, so uh, there is specialized training and I actually run um, the largest disaster medicine fellowship program in the United States. We have anywhere from 10 to 12 fellows every year um, and they come from around the world. 
Um, uh, so there are fellowship programs like that. Again, it's a year long pro program. So we have doctors in that. We also have um, a disaster nursing program fellowship that we train uh, nurses as well. Now there's a number of other training programs, you know, shorter term training programs in different aspects of disaster medicine. There's shorter programs in, let's say, chemical, biologic, and radiation. There's other shorter programs in things like the incident command system, et cetera. So there's a, there's a number of areas where you can uh, explore and get training. But as far as the more formal training, yes, there are, there are in, in Europe, there are, um, there's a master's program or a couple of master's programs. Um, in disaster medicine. Here in the United States, we tend more to do fellowships. So there are fellowships in disaster medicine. Um, so yes, there is, there, there is the, um, the ability to do formal training. And so when you look around the globe at, at this area, uh, where do you see this whole field going in the, in the future? Well, I think what we're living through now really uh, is demonstrating the need for um, a field like disaster medicine. Um, you know, and we can look at, 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 again, different kinds of disasters and how we, how we go about preparing and responding to them. Um, looking at this pandemic now, I think the lessons learned coming on the other side of the pandemic will be numerous. Um, you know, we, we, we seem to go through these pandemics time and time again. There's been uh, eight or nine over the last hundred years, some much larger than others. But um, and, and in reality, we, we go through a seasonal, you know, a pandemic every year with a seasonal flu, but so, certainly on a much lower scale. Um, but, you know, there are things that we, we, we learned from that, that, that we, well, what we've seen from that, that we don't really seem to learn so well sometimes. Um, less things such as early containment, you know, when we see a, a new um, uh, illness seeming to arise, when we see what might be a novel uh, virus arising, um, you know, how we really have to jump on that very, very quickly, very early and contain it, just keep it as just a local outbreak so it doesn't progress through an epidemic and pandemic. And some of the other aspects of this response that we could have done better, you know, like um, sourcing PPE better, that whole idea of supply chain and stockpiling and, and, and the way that we um, do crisis standards of care you know, we learn different ways of doing that all the time. So there's, there's that. Um, there's also other things that are happening, you know, that we just, we're, we're going through just now almost ending um, the uh, most active hurricane system or season in the Caribbean, I think that we've been through in history, um, I think, uh, if not very close. So, you know, uh, disasters don't stop just because there's a pandemic. So you also have that interesting um, uh, sort of <clears throat> dynamic between dealing with the pandemic and then dealing with other large disasters, natural disasters and others at the same time. So for instance, you know, we use sheltering as a, a, a significant piece or part of the response to, um, to hurricanes, for instance, um, and sheltering in the COVID age is a, is a whole different ball game, right? So there's a lot of complexities. And, and I think that, that and, and, and data has proven this out that if you look past, you know, over the past hundred years, let's say, um, there are more and more disasters affecting more and more of us. And there's a number of reasons for that. We're growing in population. We're, we're, we're moving our populations close to the areas that are more disaster prone. You know, we have much more of a presence on coastlines now um, than we did a hundred years ago, let's say. Um, we have a, a tremendous amount of technology and we're technology um, driven, um, which also means that we are susceptible to technological disasters. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of different and then climate change, of course, uh, there's a lot of different factors, I think, that are that are coming together to really increase not only the numbers of disasters that we're experiencing, but their impact on us. Um, and then also, of course, we have to worry about intentional events like terrorist attacks. And as part of the program that I run, we did come up with a term called counterterrorism medicine um, over the last four or five years that we've been uh, researching and publishing on and, um, and discussing and trying to define that as a really succinct and, 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 and different um, subset of disaster medicine that, that demands, I think, um, you know, a, a, a somewhat different uh, skill set and knowledge base. Well, I commend you on the work you've been doing because, I, you know, many times we don't get the, the pleasure of being at the forefront of, of an industry or of a profession. And, and so yeah. to be able to write books on this and, and to, to develop training programs and train people around the world in this area, I think, is needed more today than ever before. Um, I guess just from a personal perspective, what, what is the, the thing that is most rewarding to you in this field? Well, you know, everything in healthcare, everything in medicine is rewarding. It's, it's rewarding, you know, to go to the emergency department and, and treat patients and, you know, that sort of individual doctor patient uh, interaction relationship and, and have positive outcomes from that. That's, that's all very rewarding. Um, uh, but, you know, what's rewarding about this now, too, that the public health 
piece of it uh, and the education piece of it is I can now go and, and you know, for instance, from our fellowship program, we've been going now, it's almost 15 years. Um, we have uh, 67 to 68 um, alumni and a current class of fellows. So we have a lot of um, practicing disaster medicine specialists now that, have, that we've trained that are around the world. And really you'd be hard pressed to, um, you know, see a, a large scale disaster anywhere in the world and not have one of our alumni involved, um, you know, in a leadership capacity uh, and responding to it. So that's very rewarding as well, knowing that, that you know, you, you, you sort of, um, this is true in any field, but particularly in disaster medicine, because they're so unique and so different. Um, you know, the experience that you're able to glean from just the field work that you've done, and I've done a lot of field work early in my career, um, you can then kind of um, give uh, to others and, 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 and teach others from your personal experience and, and then have them go off and do some of these great things, too. So um, it's very rewarding in that sense. That's great. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything else you wanted to mention that perhaps I didn't ask about? Um, no, I just, you know, I think, I think in general, uh, if you were to convey one important thing to, um, you know, the audience that you have, it would, it would be that, um, particularly in this pandemic, for instance, um, there are times when it really, the community needs to be involved. Um, you know, we're in this pandemic now in this period where we don't have the vaccine um, yet and we don't really have good therapeutics yet. So we do this thing called um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. And that's what we've been living the last nine months, 10 months. Um, and that's essentially the social distancing, you know, personal hygiene, wearing masks, uh, the lockdown when the disease prevalence gets really high. Um, and, and people really need to buy into that because what, what these, we call them NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions, what these things do is that they bridge us <clears throat> from um, you know, the, the onset of the pandemic to the point when we do have a vaccine um, and we do have good therapeutics because it's at that point that we are going to achieve the herd immunity you're hearing about, but it's gonna be vaccine mediated herd, herd immunity, um, not the other way, which wouldn't be so good. Um, we're gonna achieve that and we're gonna get on the other side of this pandemic and the pandemic's gonna go away. The virus won't go away. In fact, we'll probably have, you know, along with a flu virus, we'll probably have a, a coronavirus vaccine every year as well. Um, but it's really the community buying into it and taking action that's going to bridge us to the, the resolution of this pandemic. So, you know, that's really, I think, the one thing to convey to, to your audience, and that is um, participate um, in, you know, the, in the ways that you can, wearing masks, social distancing, and just just understanding how to keep this virus from, you know, going from one person to the other. The virus can't live on its own, right? It can't walk down the street and knock on your door and infect you. Yeah. It's got to be, uh, you know, transmitted. If you were, if this was a utopian world and you could take every single human being and put them in a box away from every other human being for the next two weeks, um, this virus would disappear, you know, but obviously we can't do that. So yeah. all of these, these non-pharmaceutical interventions are our best attempt to try to approximate that, just to not allow the, the virus to transmit. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today. I appreciate all the work you do. And uh, I'm glad to, to bring a, and highlight some of that work so others can find out about it. So thanks again. Great. Yep. It's been my pleasure.